that's the client side of the ledger. That's sort of what they're doing or the sorts of things they're saying during the motivational interview and during, during that interaction. The, 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 the change talk, the sustained talk, and ultimately the commitment language, that's what they're doing. So now we'll just go on and talk a little bit about what we are doing, what our contribution is to that interaction. And the good news here is that there are probably um, four core skills that we bring to a motivational interview that will be things that you already do, things that you already are skilled at and, and work with you know, a lot. It's more about how to use those core skills in the context of, of change talk and evoking change talk and dealing with sustained talk and, and ultimately also rolling with resistance. So these will be um, four things that, that you're very familiar with already. The first is asking open questions. So we're really wanting to make sure that when we um, uh, are asking questions, we're asking questions that are open because that's evocative. That evokes from the person um, their uh, arguments for change. Rather than closed questions or, or um, yes, no type questions, uh, which are less likely to, to evoke from the, from the client or patient. So we're wanting to ask open questions that, that opens them up to, to offering arguments for change. Secondly, we're wanting to, uh, to affirm people. We want to affirm them in terms of their, their personal qualities, their strengths, um, their efforts and their in intentions. Um, and that's a bit about supporting self-efficacy. You know, we're wanting to affirm people so that they start to feel more confident that they can do it. Thirdly, we're, we're needing to use ref reflections. Um, basically, uh, a big part of, of the, the motivation of being approach is to be able to reflect what the person says, how they feel, what things mean to them. So using reflections um, to, to keep the, the uh, interaction going. And then finally, um, summarising. Uh, drawing together, every now and then, the person's own perspective of change. So, through a, a motivation interview, people might say certain things along the way which are kind of a bit about change and arguments for change. And every now and then, we kind of pull them together into summaries and, and sort of offer it back. One of the things, one of the quotes I liked is, um, we know what we believe when we hear what we say. And so a big part of a motivational interview is helping people to say the things, the arguments and so on for change, and then hearing that back to themselves. Um, saying back to them the things that they've said so that they become more and more familiar with perhaps what they believe. I'll just give you a few examples of open questions, affirmations and reflections just to, to have a sense of, of what that's about. But, um, so for example with open questions, one of the things really that, that we use with open questions is simply asking questions, the answer to which is change talk because we're wanting to help to get the person talking about change and, and creating that flow. So for example, um, you know, what would you like to change about your lifestyle or what would you like to change about your diet or your exercise? Um, that's a desire for change type question. Uh, if we ask what they'd like to do, then they'll start to talk about what they'd like to do. Um, secondly, you know, a question like, if you did decide to make this change, how would you go about it? That's an ability for change talk question. That's asking them about what they might do um, to make this change. Uh, another useful question is, you know, something like, what are the three best reasons for making this change? So that asks them about reasons for change talk, gets them talking about reasons. So, so tell us a bit more about kind of what you'd like to do with, with your food uh, choices. I guess I'd like to be not making those <laughs> massive you know, goes through drive through and uh -huh. um, that that's that's one part of it. And I'd really like to be to feel my body um, to basically sort of give myself the good stuff so that I get through the days. Okay. Um, yeah. Rather than you know crashing and burning sort of thing. If you were to do it more, how how could you go about it? What what, what could you do? Do you think if, to to actually do some more exercise in your life? <sighs> Well, I'd like to be able to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, so finding something enjoyable will be important. Would be enjoyable. Yeah, that's very much so. Finding something too that's probably not going to cause me a great deal of angst physically. 
In terms of need, quite a useful uh, question to ask with respect to, to need change talk is, on a scale of 0 to 100, how important is it for you to make this change? Starts to get them thinking about how important it is. But there's a really important um, follow-up question, and that is, why are you at that number and not 0? If you ask why are you at that number and not 100, they start to tell you all the, thing, all the reasons why it's not important to them. But if you ask why are you at that number and not zero, they start to elaborate on the importance, on the need, and start to talk more and more about, um, even if they were 30 out of 100, if you ask why are you at that number and not zero, they start to talk more about what makes it important to them. And then finally, uh, I guess a commitment question is, is, is even something, you know, at some point in the conversation when you feel like you've explored um, desire, ability, reason and need, you might ask a question along the lines of, you know, so what do you think you will do? Asking them to, to offer you the, what that commitment might be and what the change might be. What do you think you will do? There are some other questions or questioning strategies that are useful as well. One of the very common ones that people often know about and sort of almost equate to motivational living is something called the decisional balance. The decisional balance is, is where you ask, um, you know, what are the good things, for example, about smoking? And then later you ask, what are the less good things about smoking? So, you know, sort of asking both sides of, of um, the ambivalence. It's interesting because if you ask, what are the good things about, say, smoking, the person will start to tell you all about the good things about smoking. And, you know, that basically represents sort of sustained talk. That's kind of starts to, um, uh, they start to talk about the reasons why they, they wouldn't change. But it seems to be useful to do that for a couple of reasons. One is um, it accepts and validates that there is that side of the, the ambivalence. Sometimes, like for a smoker, for example, uh, if you sit down and, and you do ask them that question, you might be the first person who's actually been willing to you know, find out about that side and, and is willing to, to sort of respect that side of, of the, the behaviour for them. Um, everyone else in their life is sort of nagging them to stop. Here's someone who's asking them, well, what, tell me what's good about it? What, what is it that keeps you in there? The second reason to ask that question as well, I think, is it gives you some hints that you can put in the back of your mind for later when you're trying to work out an action plan. You know, so when we're trying to work out a change plan, um, if smoking is the thing they do during the day to help them relax at work, then that tells us that the action plan might need to include something that helps them to relax at work. Because if they're going to not, no longer have this, the smoking, then um, we need to replace it with a, an alternative. So that question helps to um, accept and validate the person and, and their ambivalence and it also gives us some clues for an action plan later. But then of course we move on to, so what are the less good things about smoking? Uh, and, on, and, and probably we would tend to, to spend a bit more time um, asking them about that. Quite commonly in a motivation interview you would be asking about, uh, for more elaboration. So it, it is important to just be asking people to elaborate. You know, can you tell me more about such and such? That, that's probably an important um, question to, to help evoke more of the, the change talk and ultimately commitment and asking for examples as well. W I, I mentioned that um, on a scale of 0 to 100 question. You can ask, that's called sort of like a change ruler and you can ask that kind of a question for how important it is but also how confident the person feels. It's quite nice sometimes to to find out from people, you know, how important is it for them versus how confident are they? Because one or other of those two might be the barrier of change. It might be really important to them, but they're kind of low in confidence. Or alternatively, it might be, they might feel like, oh, that'd be easy to do, but it, I just don't think I need to. So it's often useful using change rulers to disentangle those two. A and lastly, too, in terms of questioning strategies, it's useful to, to find out about people's goals and values. You know, like, um, what are your goals or, or what sort of, what, what's important to you as, as a person or a father or a husband or a worker? And, um, you know, then how does that fit with drinking or how does that fit with some of your lifestyle um, and, and behaviours? So those are some examples of, of the, the questions. Then we have the affirmations, and there's just a couple of points that I'd make about affirmations. That, that's this notion of, of statements from the clinician that affirm the patient's strengths, 
resources, intentions, their attempts, um, their achievements, as well as change talk itself. It's often useful to affirm the change talk, affirm the things people say. But it sounds like you've thought a lot about the reasons why you would make this change. That's like a, a, an affirmation to the change talk itself. But um, it's important to, to keep in mind a few things. For example, affirmations need to be done genuinely. Y you're not sort of wanting to make up an aff affirmation just for the sake of it. As it, it, the clinician, you're wanting to offer it as something genuine. Well, the good side of that is, is that you, I mean, you will know a lot about it. That you, it sounds like you probably know a lot of the facts around, I suppose, eating and what healthy choices are and, and all that sort of stuff. T tell me a bit about that. What, what would you see as being the healthy the, way to go? The healthier way to go? Yeah. Um, well, I think it, it is getting that, that, that little bit more structure and, and, mm -hmm. and various times for breaks and, yeah. and bringing in that more fruit and the grains and, mm -hmm. and those sort of areas actually into the meals rather than mm -hmm. the, the overly processed foods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> so um, there's a sort of... That, what did that evoke in you? That, that, that it burped that? Um, <coughs> yeah, it, I sort of looked at my life and s went, okay, so where am I sort of compared to... a a lot of people and I, I felt quite good where I was. Mm -hmm. um, very, felt very um, upset about my weight. That was mm -hmm. a big, up, mm -hmm. big upset and that's yeah. been, the weight's been something I've carried through all my adult life. Yeah, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty much and I come from a family that sort of, that has said, well once you hit 25 that's it, everyone just goes up in the weight and there's right. no hope. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And it was a little bit scary because I had an uncle who had a cardiac arrest at 34. Okay. So suddenly mm. 30 seems a lot closer to 34, 34 and, you know, I think, oh dear. Yeah. One piece of what you're saying there though that, that stands out for me is that, that reaching 30 and stopping and thinking about your life, there was a lot to feel good about with your life as well. Yeah. Tell, well, tell, tell me a bit about that, the, um, the things that you have achieved or have had success with. It needs to be done respectfully and pitched at a level that sort of fits with the patient themselves. Some people appreciate a, a more enthusiastic kind of, oh wow, so you've, you've reduced your cigarettes by one, that's great. And another person might prefer something more subtle, you know, like, okay, good start, right, let's move on to the next thing. So um, trying to pitch affirmations uh, at the right level for the, the person is important. And, and also the other point with affirmations is it's useful to make them kind of situationally or behaviourally specific. So rather than saying, you know, you're a really great father. The problem with that is sometimes that will evoke sort of um, you know, negative self-talk from the person. They might say, oh, yeah, but I wasn't so great last Saturday, was I, when I da 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 so instead of something really general like that, it's useful to affirm people specifically. So um, last Saturday when you turned up to little Johnny's soccer match and you were there for his, um, when he scored that goal, that was you being a really great father. So something more specific to, to help to, to, to um, you know, create that, that positive effect and that, that supporting the self-efficacy. So we've got open questions and affirmations and the third thing I was just going to mention um, a bit more on as well is, is this notion of the reflections and in fact the importance of reflections. So um, if motivational interviewing was a car, it's actually reflections that are the engine. Y y the, the word motivational interviewing sort of sounds like it's about questions. It sounds like it's about asking questions and interviewing the person. But actually we're more likely to be doing these reflections. We're more likely to be um, either doing simple reflections, which is kind of just saying back to the person what they've just said to you, or more complex reflections where we try to arrive at a bit of a hunch or a bit of a hypothesis about what the person really is feeling or what they're meaning and offer that back to them. So rather than asking questions, we're using these reflective statements to help people to keep thinking about their perspective on change and help people to keep thinking about their ambivalence and ultimately moving towards, towards change. Carl Rogers, who is a, a sort of a very well-known psychologist that developed client-centred therapy, one of his quotes is, um, reflections are more than a repetition, they're a revelation. And that's what we want to create with these reflections. We want to offer people something, um, something to them from what they've said where they go, yes, that's exactly how I feel about this. And as a clinician, you can kind of sort of 
sort of feel pretty good about that and you know like uh, whatever but all you're doing is you're just saying back to them the things that they've just told you perhaps with a couple of hunches or hypotheses about how they feel or what it means yes it sounds a little bit like um, exercise really fits with sort of who you are or how you see yourself um, exercise is a part of who you've been in your life and, it and it's a part of it what's l allowed you to feel happy, confident, effective um, and some of those things are... I didn't realise it earlier, I, you know, you're right, I didn't realise that earlier in my life yeah. but now that I'm sort Looking of... Looking back... Told, yeah, I, yeah. I, I sort of, I can feel the effects now. Yes, in the reverse. In the reverse, yeah, in the yes. reverse of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those are some pretty powerful reasons because there's, you know, um, now that uh, there's, some, there's some time now in your life where you're wanting to be happy and effective and you've got things that you, that you want to do. Yeah, well, um, I'm a single guy and uh, I guess that, uh, you know, we have more time perhaps at night when, you know, you'd... Uh, I'd grab a book and, or sit down and uh, perhaps even want to see my favourite show on TV. Um, but you get to thinking, you know, mm. you know, perhaps I should be, you know, doing a bit of exercise. Yeah. Okay. But um, following through on that and mm. actually, mm. you know, I say just, just following through on it, that's definitely the preference, but yep. the following through, I sort of fall down there and fall into that old trap of, oh, well, I'll just go there. It'll, yeah. it'll be something. It's food. Yes, and you've identified that habit bit to it as well. Yeah. Um, in fact, it sounds like you've, you've sort of identified a little bit that, that to change some of this will be about, you know, kind of changing habits as yep. well. That'll be part of the challenge.